we finished up the last chapter, the third chapter last week. And verse 1, uh, now Moses is still talking with the Lord. The Lord is still talking to Moses. Uh, the chapter the burning bush. And notice uh, what happens. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, uh, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. He's a smart man, right? <laughs> Verse 4. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. Well, that's not so smart, is it? Um, but if God says do it, what are you supposed to do? Do it. Just do it, right? And he put forth his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand there once again. And verse 5, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. Uh, and then verse 6, it goes on and says, And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put forth his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hear or hearken to the sign of the, uh, the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. Wow. Uh, let's stop right there. Father, this is the word of God tonight as we study in this uh, particular chapter. What a, what a great uh, thoughts here, the Lord, do we have tonight. I believe it will be a blessing to, to each of us uh, as we deal with this issue in our lives oftentimes. And so, Lord, we ask that you would uh, speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Moses' life mission, and guess what we're going to talk about tonight? His five big excuses. <laughs> Moses had lots of excuses, do you? <laughs> we can all come up with excuses, can't we, for things that, uh, uh, that we want to do or whatever. We're going to skip to go through these, some of these pretty quickly because we've already studied them. What is an excuse? Well, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, a reason or an explanation, not necessarily... Not necessarily true completely, right? Uh, but given in order to make something appear more acceptable or less offensive. And so we offer people excuses when we don't want to do whatever they're asking us to do. Well, I've got something else planned, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm going to, you know, I can't do it. And whatever, we come up with reasons. Uh, are they always true reasons? Are they always <laughs> real reasons? Uh, not always, right? So, excuse number one, go back to chapter three. Remember, there was this excuse that Moses gave when he was called by God. Back in uh, chapter three, verse 11 and 12, it says this, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And, uh, and so his first excuse was the who me excuse. You know, who, who am I? Uh, uh, he struggled, you see, with his identity, who he was, and and he, and he, you know, he, he just couldn't comprehend why God would want to use him. Now, what was God's response to that? Well, in verse 12 of that chapter, God said, look, I'm going to be with you. Certainly, I will be with you, and, uh, and, and so forth. And so God promised his presence. By the way, has God promised his presence with you and with, with for me uh, in our lives? Absolutely, he has. And so uh, let's just cut that excuse out, right? We don't need that one anymore. Who am I? Well... Uh, we sang about that this morning. Uh, uh, you know, we're really nothing, but God chooses to use us anyway, right? And so that's what that's all about. Excuse number two was, the who are you excuse? Moses helped and here fell a, a lack of intimacy with God himself. It's found there in chapter 5 and verse uh, 13 and 14. So he moves quickly from his first excuse to his second excuse. And there in chapter 3, verse 13, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? I don't even know your name, God. In other words, he said, God, I don't know you that well. Uh, maybe that's a good excuse. Well, God's response was, just tell them this. Tell them I am that I am, right? And uh, uh, that he is the God of, of Isaac and the God of uh, Israel and, and Jacob and so forth. And so, uh, you know, the who are you excuse? Now, there's no excuse for this, right? We have the Word of God. We all know who God is, right? 
uh, we ought to have a relationship with him, and we do through Christ. And then number three, uh, we had the excuse number uh, three. Well, what, and this is in chapter four, so this is where we're picking up tonight. Chapter four, verses one through nine. This third excuse is the what if excuse. Have you ever used a what if excuse? Well, well what if, what if the money doesn't come in? What if, what if I'm not able to, to be there uh, for that? What if, what if, don't we use that the phrase a lot, you know, in, in our thought process at least? Well, and we use it to kind of, help our, get ourselves out of some situations maybe we don't uh, want to be in. Moses felt, in this case, he felt pretty much intimidated by, by this. Uh, they, they're not going to believe me, God, is what he's saying. They, they're not going to hearken unto me. And then we said in verse 4, they're not, they will not hearken unto to my voice. Uh, and they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto you. And, and so he's trying to use this particular excuse. And God's response is what? When I'm finished, they're going to listen. <laughs> okay. They will believe you. Uh, when, and he gave him, what, what did he give him? Three different signs here that he could use. Uh, God says, well, look, here, if they won't believe you the first time, uh, try the rod, you know, throw it down. What's it going to turn into? It'll turn into a snake. Uh, and, and then pick it back up. Now, by the way, I would be pretty impressed if, if someone were to come in and do that tonight, wouldn't you? You know, that would, well, first of all, it would scare me. I don't like snakes. <laughs> And I would have to run after Candy because she'd be screaming her way out of the building. <laughs> right? Because she hates snakes. You got that right. 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 We have to sell our houses one another. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but, her, you know, but, but, you know, that would be pretty amazing to see that, uh, that happen, right? Someone that was able, not a magician, not fake, not, uh, you know, not an illusion, so to speak, but something that really, really would take place. And so he says, use that. Then he said, second, what about the leprous hand? He said, well, yeah. you know, stick your hand in your, in your, under your, your coat and, and uh, pull it back out. And your hand is all leprous and sickly and, uh, you know, the skin's going to fall off. And leprosy was a terrible disease that, that was incurable, right? And so, and then put it back in and pull it out again and, and you're back whole again. I mean, that would be pretty impressive, right? Uh, so that's going to help a little bit. And then what was the third thing you told him to do? That doesn't work? Water from the... Yeah, take, take some water from the river, pour it out on the ground. What's it going to turn into? It's going to turn into blood. Uh, I don't know many people who can do that. <laughs> and uh, he said God's response then was this what if excuse. And his, he felt intimidated by, by this. That they're not going to listen to me. And, and by the way, is that an excuse why we sometimes don't uh, invite people to church? Mm. Well, they're not going to listen. They're not going to come anyway. Why should I do it, right? Uh, and maybe we feel intimidated by, by the, the, the rejection that we might encounter when we uh, go out and try to witness to someone. Well, maybe they won't want to hear what I have to say. So uh, not, not a good excuse, though. His five big excuses, number three, was the what if excuse. Let's go to number four. We didn't read these verses yet, verses 10 through uh, 12. This is the defective excuse. Hmm. And here Moses frets about his own uh, inadequacies as a person. Look what he says in verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, and who made the dumb or, or, or deaf or the seeing or the blind, have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt do say. So what's God's response? Just, who made you? You know, uh, Don't call yourself a pile of junk when God made you, right? Amen. And God, if he made you and, and he calls you, then he will enable you. He'll give you uh, the power to do that. You can overcome these inadequacies that we oftentimes uh, feel um, in our lives. And uh, uh, I know many preachers that have felt that way. You know, God, when they, when they get called to preach, it's like, I, I, I can't do that, Lord. I, I can't even get, get, get up and talk with a bunch, before a bunch of, uh, 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 of people, you know. I, I stutter or I, I'm going to stumble over my words or I won't know what to say or whatever. Just stop, amen? Quit using excuses when it comes to the Lord, right? Uh, just listen to what he has to say. So this... This is not a good excuse. And we can come up with reasons why we can't do something, right? Mm -hmm. We can be, we feel like we're defective. Well, God can take your defect and he can, he can make you effective in serving him and, and uh, as he gifts you to do that. All right, number five, the fifth excuse is the, is the well, this is the, one of the best ones, the someone else excuse. Yeah. 
Lord, find somebody else to do it, right? There's got to be someone better here, around here, to do this job than me. And so Moses, of course, he was feeling uh, quite inferior at this, uh, this stage in his life. Uh, verse 13 and 14. Verse 13 says, And he said, unto, uh, he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. In other words, he's saying, God, send somebody else and let him do it. In verse uh, uh, 14 uh, notice how the Lord responds to this excuse. Mm -hmm. He's so happy about it, right? Yeah, yeah, he gets, he gets a little ticked off. And the anger of the Lord uh, was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he saith thee, he will be glad in his heart. So he's, uh, you know, now, I don't know why God, uh, you know, didn't just make Moses do it. You know, God doesn't make us do things against our, you know, our will. Uh, but uh, and he sometimes does make a way for us to, to be involved in his work. And so God's response was, okay, I will allow Aaron to go with you, but I'm still calling you. And so God still held Moses responsible for this task that had to be done, even though Aaron was going to be there by his side helping him uh, through this most of the way. So these five big excuses that Moses used. Now, why do you think Moses offered all of these excuses to the Lord? Was it because of rebellion? Huh? Poor self-esteem? Just being disobedient? Um, afraid? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and you hit it right the nail around the head. His big, big problem was fear. He, he was dealing with fears that he had in his, in his life, in his heart, and these, uh, these. This was his, this was his big issue. Uh, we go back to Exodus three, verse six, and it says this uh, in that verse. Said more, he said, "I am the God of thy father, and the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob." And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid. He was afraid. He, we see his his fear uh, there. His fear of of he was afraid of God, which we certainly should be in a sense. But he was also afraid of people. He was afraid of of uh, failure. He was afraid of rejection. He was afraid of all of these these thoughts come into his mind that it's just not going to work. God, you know, you you got to get somebody else. I can't do it. I'm not adequate. I'm not able. Uh, uh, you know, I I don't even know who you are. All these things he comes up with. Now, here's some signs of fear that we face sometimes and uh, when, you, when you question your identity when you when you begin to question that you're living out of fear in your life when you when you uh you sense a lack of intimacy with with god and with others a lot of times that's caused by fear in our lives that won't let us get close to other people when you are intimidated by people or circumstances then oftentimes that's a sign that you're living in what in fear and living in fear and then when you feel inadequate for the task at hand, obviously that's a sign that uh, you're, 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 there's fear welling up inside of your heart. Uh, when you as, uh, assess, uh, excuse me, assert your own inferiority, and you, you know you say things, well, I, I, I've never, you know, I've never been able to do this, and I'm not, I can't teach, and I, I can't sing, and I can't do this, and I can't do that, and whatever. You're living out of fear. You ever had to battle fear in your life? Most people do to some degree or the other, you know, uh, and and they cope in different ways. And uh, uh, you know, some people put on a, a bravado kind of a well, you know, I'm just going to be you know like a like a bull in a china shop, and I'm going to go in and I'm just going to you know rip everything apart, and and I'm going to be the boss, and I'm going to be in charge, and you know, but really, what they're they're, they're that way because of fear, or maybe they go into a shell. You know, and just kind of, kind of, you know, it's just I want to stay away from people. I don't want to get hurt, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to feel that, you know, inadequacy in my own heart and life. Listen, we all struggle with this at times in our life, and uh, we need to understand. By the way, God understands we struggle with these things. I mean, why do you think He put this story in here? Why, why is it so detailed for us? Because it deals with a real central problem that we deal with all the time of being afraid, of, of feeling fear in our lives. 
So what was Moses' greatest fears? If you look at it from the standpoint, I, I think it, his real fear was one of the main ones that people deal with is fear, fear, of, fear of failure. Uh, someone once asked, you know, uh, I read a, read a statement one time, says, what would you be willing to do for the Lord if you knew you could not fail? You know, if you just knew that there was no way you could fail, what would you be willing to, to, to step out and do? Well, what's keeping us from doing those things, you know? It's that fear that we will fail, that it won't work, that, that uh, you know, it, it, that God won't come through, and He won't provide. So there's this fear of failure, and then, of course, the second one that goes along with that is fear of rejection. The fear of having people push you away or say no or, or you know, shut the door, slam the door in your face or whatever, if you're out uh, visiting or whatever. So people don't like that, right? Because it, it just intensifies what they already felt inside. You know, I'm not good enough. That's the reason that happened. That I, I'm inadequate. I, I don't uh, have what it takes to do this. And so Moses faced these particular things in his life. Here's some facts about fear that we need to understand. Number one, fear has plagued the human race since the beginning of creation. It's nothing new. Not a 20th century phenomenon, 21st century phenomenon. What century are we in, anyway? Anybody know? I don't know. Uh, uh, fear has plagued the human race since the very beginning. 66 verses into the Bible, you'll find the very first mention of fear. Verse 66, uh, Genesis 3:10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was what? Right. I was afraid. Because I was, didn't have any clothes on, and I hid myself. So, uh, there's, there's fear cropping up early on. Now, of course, it happened right after sin, right? And so there was something about the sin that created in, in us, our sin nature carries with it a, a built-in fear factor. Not, not, I'm talking about being afraid of snakes or scorpions or lizards or, you know, bugs or things, but, but a built-in fear that uh, we can never measure up uh, in our lives. So fear has plagued the human race. Fear is universal. I mean, every nation, every country, every people group, they all have this, this, this idea of fear. Number two, we, we have all have experienced some sort of fear in our life. Dr. Tim LaHaye, uh, who wrote some great uh, Christian books uh, uh, a number of years ago, he, he detailed 16 forms of fear that plague Christians. He did this detailed study and looked at uh, the lives of, of believers and followers of Jesus, not the world, but but believers, and he came up with these 16 categories of fear, and uh, the first one was what? Anxiety. Anxiety. Uh, you know any Christians that deal with anxiety? Mm -hmm. They just worry, worry, worry about everything and anything, and, you know, just kind of, uh, uh, how about doubts? Do Christians sometimes have doubts? Now, not everybody, not everybody does. Not everybody has anxiety, but, but a lot of people do, and we understand that, uh, uh, how about uh, timidity? And that's just being uh, very timid, very, you know, uh, not, not voicing our faith, not uh, talking to others and whatever. Uh, another fear is uh, the category is withdrawal, where people just want to withdraw from others. Uh, loneliness, over-aggressiveness. I'll just give you this list here. Uh, worry, inferiority, cowardice, suspicion, uh, hesitancy, depression, uh, is another one, haughtiness, being very prideful, uh, shy, superstitious even. Wow. So those are some of the different kinds of fears that can crowd into our lives if we allow them to. Uh, number three, our fears left to, them, to themselves are what? They're destructive. Fear is destructive. It's, it's not good for your body. Uh, it's not good for your, uh, uh, for your physical makeup. It carry fear will cause you to get sick, right? It'll cause your body to break down, uh, you know, and, and uh, not uh, be immune to different kinds of diseases and things like that. So fear is very destructive. It's usually destructive in relationships as well. If you're, if you're, you know, if you one person in a relationship is very fearful, it, it affects the, the how the people get along mm -hmm. with one another. So uh, and, and here's the bad thing: fear breeds more fear. So, so it, it kind of it kind of expands. It kind of seems to grow if we allow it. Fear uh, leads to inaction. Fear causes us to draw back, and so we don't take action when we should. Oftentimes in life, fear contributes to uh, divided thinking. Uh, 
What is it James said? A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And so if, uh, let's, let's contrast fear with another word that starts with F, and it's the word faith. So, so can you be double-minded and be, you know, full of faith and be full of fear at the same time? You're not supposed to be, right? <laughs> should be, should be one or the uh, one or the other probably in your life. But we're not to live in a divided uh, thinking in our lives. It's not good for us. Uh, fear produces isolation because again we tend to withdraw when we're fearful, and so we we, we don't, uh, uh, you know, show up to situations where we usually would if we're fearful. Fear births procrastination. You know, we put things off, you know, out of fear, right? Don't you, you know, one of the things that I had to learn early on in, in business, uh, because uh, honestly, I was very, um, uh, very timid uh, growing up. And so uh, when I first uh, started in, in my business, uh, I didn't like having to pick up the phone and call customers about problems. You know, so what did I do? Put it, off. Put it off. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> right. <laughs> or I'll get Ken to call them. Right. That's yeah. And sometimes you do that. But but you know, can can you help me out here? Do problems usually go away when you don't address them? No. 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 They don't. They they just usually get bigger. The person gets more. If they're upset already, they get more upset. You know, with you, uh, uh, you know, and so forth. So uh, I had to learn that the hardest thing of my day was sometimes to make those phone calls. And so uh, uh, I used to, I remember sitting in my office room saying, okay, there, I've got, I would write down six things I've got to do today on a, on a legal sheet. And if it one of them involved fear, I would put it first on the list. I didn't always take care of it first, but <laughs> like I should have. But I, but I would make sure I put that down. You know, I've got to call Joe. You know, I've got to call somebody about this issue and try to take care of that. Now, uh, that still comes up once in a while, right? There's situations we don't want to we don't want to deal with. We we don't want the we don't want the, the 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 person on the other end to yell at us or get upset with us or whatever. So we kind of put those things off. And so fear births this idea of procrastination. So we. We oftentimes put it off here. Create uh, creates what we would call unrealized potential. In other words, you, you never become all that God wants you to be when you live your life in fear. Three fatalities of fear. I'll give you number one. Fear robs us of the best of ourselves. Uh, fear is a, is a thief. Fear is a liar. Yeah, there's a great song out right now called Fear is a Liar uh, on Christian radio. That's, uh, that's so true. But fear robs us. Uh, of the very best of life in our, in our lives because uh, it holds us back, you know, keeps us from uh, developing the, what we should. Fear ties us down oftentimes. Uh, fear it messes with our mind, you know, and, and our emotions, and, and so we kind of get out of whack. I'm just telling you that fear is a robber. It's a thief in our lives. Number two, fear robs us of the best of others. Uh, we can because oftentimes you know we can you can transfer your fear to other people. You can transfer your fear to your children. Uh, and, and many people make that mistake, you know, and, uh, that they uh, uh, they kind of uh, maybe your parents have done that or did that with you. They 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 taught us to fear things and and to use fear as a reason oftentimes not to do something uh, in life, and so. Uh, fear can be uh, can, can hold other people back as well. And then number three, and this very the third fatality of fear, we can, uh, well, let's see, we aren't going to move to number three yet. We can become what uh, John Maxwell called lids to other people who follow us. And so fear can cause you to keep other people, uh, keep a lid on people. In other words, keep them from developing their potential. And so I must reach my potential so that those who follow me can reach their potential is kind of the idea behind that. And then uh, number three, fear robs us of the best from God. Mm -hmm. God had something great for Moses, didn't he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Moses was trying to let fear rob him of being the great man that God wanted him and called him to be. Uh, 
He was Moses was wanting fear to, you know, he, he was wanting to step back from that place, but God wanted him to step forward, step up, uh, and become the man of God that he was called to be. By the way, uh, I love this verse. It's uh, one of my favorites, 2 Timothy 1 7. If you don't know it by heart, you ought to memorize this verse. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Would you say that with me tonight? Uh, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Wow. See, those three things overcome fear, don't they? You know, you get the power of God, you got love in your heart, you have your sound thinking, you're no longer, you know, letting yourself be uh, led astray by fears in your heart and life. And so, uh, listen, fear doesn't come from God doesn't come from him, right? That comes from our enemy oftentimes. He loves to use fear as a weapon, as a tool for your life and for mine. Uh, let's let's read Psalm uh, chapter 78 for just a minute. Uh, you'll turn over there with me. Psalm 78. There's a couple of verses in that psalm that I'd like for you to see tonight. Verse number 9, verse number 41. Um, we're talking about fear robs us of, of the best uh, from God. Uh, just this little verse. Uh, we don't, you know, don't. I'm not going to preach the whole context here of what's going on exactly in Psalm 78, but it's a great, ver great chapter. And verse nine says, "The children of Ephraim, they were one of the tribes of Israel, and they represent Israel, right? As you ladies learned recently, being armed and carrying bows, turn back." In the day of battle. Now, what do you suppose caused them to turn back? Fear. Probably fear, right? Their fear of, of the battle that was ahead, that they might lose their life, that they might lose the battle, probably caused them to turn back. Do you think God was pleased with that? I don't think so. Look at verse 41 then. Verse 41. And uh, here's what it says in verse 41. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. I preached a message about four years ago on limiting God. You, uh, you remember that or not, but it's one of my favorite messages because it, it shares this thought that you and I have the potential of limiting what God wants to do in our lives right. and in our church and in our family. And one of the great limiters is fear. It keeps you know uh, God from pouring out all the blessings that he wants to give us and so they turned back, they tempted God, they limited God's work in their lives. Listen, here, here's a point I want you to remember. God works through people of faith, not through people of fear. You know, and if we want to be used of God, we want to be blessed of God as a church, we've got to be people of faith, right? And trusting Him, believing Him, walking with Him. Because uh, God, and I believe God will give us the power to cope with our fears. Just a couple more slides here. Uh, deliverance from fear. How about Psalms 34 and verse 4? Can we be delivered from fear? Well, David was. He said this. You may not be able to read that from where you're at, but I'll read it for you. It says, I sought the Lord and he heard me. He delivered me from all of my fears, right? They looked upon him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth about around about them that fear him and delivereth them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Right? Do you notice uh, the word fear is used twice in there? Once about fearing God, which is a good kind of fear. The other is about the bad kind of fear, right? Of uh, the fear of man, fear of circumstances and situations. And so God, David writes uh, that I sought the Lord. He heard me. He delivered me. Uh, we need to trust him for that. Amen. Power to cope with fear. When fear comes, admit it. Say, listen, God, I, I'm really feeling afraid in this situation. I'm feeling the fear rise up in my heart. I, I, I feel like I'm not, you know, I'm not handling this correctly because I'm feeling this fear in my life. And Psalm 18, verse 4 says, The sorrows of death compassed me. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. And maybe it's the circumstances that you're in that cause the fear to whelm up. But after you admit your fears, here's the thing to do. 
commit your fears to God. Right. Just give them to Him, right? He can handle them. You may not be able to, <laughs> but He can. Do you believe that tonight? Yeah. Amen? He can handle our fears. The Bible says, casting all of your care upon Him, for He cares for you. So why not, you know, cast uh, your fear upon Him? And then as you commit your fears to God, release them and accept God's deliverance. Accept that release that God wants to give to you and I. And as you accept God's deliverance, replace unwholesome fear with godly fear. So fearing God, trusting him, rather than being worried and sick over on the other side, living in a spirit of fear in our lives. Again, Psalm 34 would be a good psalm to read about how to deal with our fears in our life. I hope this lesson has been a blessing and a help to you tonight. Would you bow your heads with me this evening? Father, um, Lord, the truth is we've all dealt with fears in our life. And like Moses, feeling uh, uh, inadequate, feeling like uh, we're underqualified, feeling like, God, that uh, we don't, uh, we're not going to be successful in what we try to do for you. And, and Lord, maybe that holds us back oftentimes. We fear the scorn of others. We fear the rejection. We fear, uh, Lord, uh, failure. And so, Father, we pray that all of these fears that can plague us as, as, as people, as human beings, that, God, that you would provide answers, that you would provide uh, deliverance, that you would provide the help we need as we admit them, as we uh, can cast them upon you, Lord, as we trust in you, as we uh, put our faith in you rather than put our confidence in the fears that come into our lives. So, Lord, uh, I pray this, bless, this message has been a blessing to someone here tonight that needed it. And may you work this week in, the, in our hearts and draw us closer to you, we pray, in the precious and wonderful name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand with us as we just uh, a verse of invitation?